Is it possible according to the Torah that there could be life elsewhere? One of the first Jewish sages to discuss this outright was Rabbi Chazdoi Kreskas, one of the Rishonim in the 11th century. He says as follows, there's nothing to preclude the existence of extraterrestrial life in Judaism. Nothing to say that it doesn't exist. No reason to think not. There's nothing to say, you know, for sure there is, but there's nothing, no reason to think not. On the other hand, <laughs> Rabbi Yosef Albo, Rabbi Kreskas' student, author of Sefer Ikrim, says extraterrestrial life is a no-no in Judaism. Can't happen. So the whole world, the whole universe was created for us, was created for mankind. It was created for a creature that has free will. So these creatures could not have free will. That's only, that's only something that human beings can have. So the fact also that they're not even interacting with or benefiting a free-willed creature means that they cannot exist. Animals don't have free will, but we use them, we utilize them, we interact with them. They serve a purpose in the world. They serve a purpose as the backdrop to life. Angels also don't have free will. But they, again, they serve a purpose, they're interacting with us, they, they serve some sort of need to a free-willed being. Everything in existence has to be somehow related back to the free-willed being, the human being. So these opinions, the yay and the nay, are brought down in a book called Sefer Habris. And the Sefer Habris says, he brings that extraterrestrial life could exist. But it's possible. They're just They just don't have free will. But it's possible that they do exist. There are other creatures out there, they just don't have free will. And he brings a proof. He brings a, a little passage from the Talmud, the Gemara of Haidah Zara, that says that God travels through 18,000 worlds. There's a Gemara that says God travels through the 18,000 worlds. He interprets that as literal worlds, that these are literal worlds that exist. Now, many people say that these 18,000 worlds are figurative, they're not literal worlds, but there is room to believe that they are literal. The Magen Avram, in the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, says something very interesting. He answers the question, why the week before Rosh Hashanah, we say the slichot, the, the penitent prayers. The week before Rosh Hashanah, why we do it in the early hours of the morning? Why that time? Why not late at night? Why not the middle of the day? Why early in the morning? And he says, because throughout the night, God is dealing with the other 18,000 worlds. And by the early morning, He comes to us. He's dealing with us. This is an auspicious time to... So, there's definitely room... Rabbi Yehuda ben Barzilai of Bar Barcelona, an 11th century sage, on his commentary to Sefer Yitzira, speculates about the existence of life on these 18,000 worlds. There's additionally a, a source brought from the Talmud. There's a verse in the Book of Judges. There's a, a whole section in the Book of Judges called the Song of Devorah. Devorah was a prophetess. And she, she sang a song in praise of God for helping win a battle against the enemy Sisera. And one of the passages in her song say as follows, Cursed is Meros, and cursed are its inhabitants. It contained those words. Cursed is Meros, and cursed are its inhabitants. The Talmud, the Gemara Mayit Katan says, brings an opinion that Meros is the name of a star. Implying that the inhabitant, that this star has inhabitants. Now, even though the Zohar and Rabbeinu Hananel both say that the inhabitants refer to the planets that surround that star, that's what the inhabitants are talking about, nevertheless, you know, in any event, the groundwork is laid for accepting the idea of life on other planets. So we have to ask the next question. Okay, fine. In theory, there could be life on other planets. 
Now, is it intelligent life? You know, when, when NASA makes all its research, they're, they're not so much looking for ET as they're looking, they're even looking for bacteria. They're looking for the signs of life. So you may have life in the universe, but are the inhabitants, are these creatures intelligent creatures? Is it intelligent life? So first of all, intelligence in the Torah is different than sometimes the way we think of intelligence. Intelligence in the Torah is not based on the amount of information. A computer contains a tremendous amount of information, however, a computer is not intelligent. Okay? Even angels, which are said to contain greater knowledge than we have, greater knowledge than we're privy to, lack a certain thing in the category of intelligence. Intelligence in the Torah's context means the capacity to take, to, excuse me, the capacity to make free will decisions. That's intelligence. The fact that you can determine between right and wrong, good and evil. Free will can only exist with a Torah. How can you know what's good and what's, what's not good? How can you know what to embrace and what to abstain from if there's no Torah? Torah is absolute truth. So you can't have an intelligent being, one that's able to choose from right or wrong, a free-willed being without a Torah. So if there is life in the universe, if there is intelligent life in the universe, they would have to have a Torah. Now, could they have a different Torah? We have our Torah, they have their Torah. It's not possible. Torah is absolute truth. There can't be two truths. There's one truth. Torah is not a history book. In Judaism, we don't look at Torah as the Jewish people's history and chronology of what happened to us. It's described as the blueprint of creation. That God actually looked at this Torah. This is the will of God, the wisdom of God. And God created the universe from this blueprint. The Torah is merely the blueprint of creation. It's absolute truth, the wisdom and will of God. In the Gemara, the Talmud, Gemara Psachim, says that Rabbi Yezer says, were it not for the Torah, the heavens and earth would not be created. All the galaxies, everything in them were put there so man could accept the Torah here. The Divri Chaim explains in Medrash, says that all the worlds and all were created uninhabited. Okay, so they don't have a different Torah. Could they have the same Torah? Maybe they have the same Torah as us. It's absolute truth. Maybe we have the Torah and they also have the Torah. Also not so possible. Why? Do they celebrate Passover and Sukkot? Were they slaves in Egypt? Imagine trying to calculate when the new moon is when you're living on Jupiter and there's 12 moons. Despite the idea, even in secular thought these days, despite the idea when we look at the universe and we think how vast it is that we must not be alone, Scientists these days are, are getting along the track saying, you know what, we, we actually may be alone. Recently, Peter Ward, professor of biology and earth space science at the University of Washington, and Donald Brownlee, a, an astronomer, published a book called Rare Earth. And in this book they describe, and they go through in, in great detail, that the universe is fundamentally hostile to the upkeep of life, any kind of life. That is really unlikely that life would exist anywhere else. Even though it's such a big universe, it's such a vast cosmos, it's very unlikely, according to them, that there is anything else. So should we look? Are we wasting our time? Dr. Velvel Green it's a biologist who was asked by NASA to be, to be on a project where they were looking for life on Mars. So he was a chassid, and he asked the Lubavitcher Rebbe, is this something that is worth endeavoring? Should we be looking for life on Mars? So the Rebbe answered him, said, look for life on Mars. And if you don't find it there, look somewhere else. Because for you to sit here, for any of us to sit here and say that there's no life elsewhere, is to put limits on the Creator, is to put limits on what He can do. So go, look! 
practically speaking, what does this mean for us? What does this have to do with anything in our life? We have to realize the greatness of everything that we have and the greatness of everything that we do. That the entire cosmos, the vast universe, you look at those pictures of the, from the Hubble telescope, the whole thing, everything, was created for us. And everything that we do, every action, every word, and every thought that we have has a cosmic ripple effect for the positive or for the negative. When we do everything that we need to do, we cause the cosmic ripple effect to affect the entire universe. All the cosmos are influenced by our little action down here. And that's because God is not only infinitely big, also infinitely small. He's intricately connected to everything that we do. So let's, as free-willed beings, the only free-willed beings, start making the right choices.